welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. We find ourselves this morning in a new section in the book of Genesis. Really from Genesis chapter 37 verse 2 all the way to the end of this book, that is the end of chapter 50. The focus now becomes on Jacob's family, and in particular, what became of Jacob's family, and there'll be a focus on how the Lord will use Joseph and even his other sons ultimately to further his plan. If you remember, in Genesis 3, God had promised after the fall that he would send the seed of this woman who would crush the head of the serpent and would reverse the effects of the fall. Someone who would overcome sin and death and would restore his kingdom back to the Lord. And so God is now going to move that plan forward in and through uh, Jacob's sons, namely Joseph and his brothers. And this is the beginnings of it. And really, historically, if you think about it, This was important because as the people of Israel are listening to this, this is the origins of how the nation of Israel came about. How the 12 tribes of Israel came about from the 12 sons of Jacob. And as sinful and as dysfunctional as this family was, of how God will then change them, and do a wonderful work in their life. It also gives basis historically as to how the nation of Israel then ended up in Egypt. Because of all that will transpire in chapters 37 to 50. I would say then theologically there's also a big picture. Because if the life of Abraham was all about what it means to have faith and to rest in the Lord, and the life of Jacob was a lot about the grace of God and how, how Jacob was then turned to Israel, meaning that as God's people, we are to cling on to God, and He's the one who strives. He's the one who will fight off enemies, and He's the one who will preserve His people. He's the one who will work. Now, as we come to Joseph and his brothers, the big theme is the providence of God, of how God will purposefully move his plan through the sin of people, through the circumstances of life, through the faithfulness of a few, to accomplish his plan, whereby he will even use evil to bring about the good of his people. God will do the work, and he will work in such a way for his people that he will use even evil. He's working in and through evil for the good of his people. And really, beyond that, there's even a a pattern that develops here. Because the pattern that you see here in Genesis 37 that begins is the account of a father who has a beloved son. And he sends his beloved son on a mission. And when he sends his son on this mission, he finds that his brothers will then betray him. And will be handed over to foreigners. Where this beloved son will be made a slave, treated as nothing, presumed dead. Where he'll be mocked at, stripped off his clothes, and left for dead. And yet, he will then be raised up this very son that was rejected will be raised up to deliver 
this dysfunctional family and the people of Israel. It'll be a pattern of the great Redeemer that will come one day in the person of Jesus Christ. This morning I've titled the sermon as Joseph and his brothers. And we're going to look at this section under two headings. Just in what generally happens in this chapter. First, we will see how Joseph is hated by his brothers in verses 2 through 11. And then in verses 12 through 36, we'll see how Joseph is sold by his brothers. So firstly, Joseph hated by his brothers. Verse 2. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now this term, uh, report, uh, it's used in other parts of Scripture. In fact, the same word is used in Proverbs 10, 18, uh, and it's translated there as slander. Again, the same word is used in Ezekiel 36 and verse 3, where that same word is translated as evil gossip. So in this beginning scene, what we see is Joseph, this young 17-year-old, he's slandering his older brothers to his father. Yes, it's, you know, it's important for the father to know how his sons are doing. But really, rather than slandering them, Joseph, you know, he could have perhaps spoken to them or other ways of communicating the concern that he may have had about his brothers. But what you see here, just in the first verse itself, is that Joseph is young and perhaps a little immature. And he's telling on his brothers, and there's a certain tension already that we see between him and his brothers as he brings a bad report about them to his father. But Joseph was the dearly loved son of Jacob. Look at verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his, bro- any of his sons. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. You know, Joseph was the firstborn son of his beloved wife, Rachel. They waited for a long time. If you remember, for those of, us who, for those of you who've been here, Rachel was barren for a long time. So they waited a long time for Joseph to be born. And so once the firstborn son of his beloved wife, Rachel, is born, Jacob is perhaps thinking, this is now the son of promise. The son through whom the seed line will come. You know, perhaps he's the one who will make everything right, or it is through his line that the Messiah will come. And so because of this, Joseph was dearly loved by Jacob more than any of his other sons. Now, if you remember, this favoritism has been going on for a while. Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, but he got deceived and he got married to Leah. And we read of how finally he gets married to both of them, as well as uh, two concubines, their servants. And yet what happens is that 
Jacob only favors his beloved wife, Rachel, while he despised Leah. He never loved her. There was favoritism there already. Then we saw of how when Jacob was coming back with his family to to the land of Canaan, as he's preparing to meet his brother Esau, and they were in different files. What did he do? He put the maidservants and their children, who are his sons as well, right in front. Then Leah, his not-so-loved wife, after that. And it was Rachel and beloved Joseph right at the back. Why? Because just in case something would happen, Rachel and Joseph would have the greatest chance of escaping. And then beyond that, we saw because of this favoritism that was going on, Jacob was negligent with all his other children. We saw of how when they were in Shechem, Dinah was defiled by a man in Shechem. And Jacob's response, nothing. He was passive. And then, his, then her brothers act out in vengeance. Yes, their desire for justice was good, but they go and massacre all the men in Shechem. That's vengeance. That's not justice. That's sinfully acting out in the flesh. And again, this is bec- J- Jacob is not holding back his sons. They, you know, he is just concerned about his beloved son and his beloved wife. And then we saw after that how Reuben, the oldest brother, even slept with one of his wives, the concubine wife, Bilhah, because he was trying to assert his authority over his father, saying, Dad, your time is done now. Now it's me. I'm going to take charge. Why? Perhaps because his mother was always mistreated. He was Leah's son. All of this favoritism and all this is going on, And yet here, now with the sons too, Jacob continues to love Joseph more than any of his other sons. This is really sad, and God hates favoritism in, you know, treating somebody just because of uh, certain emotions we may have with regards to someone. Any kind of partiality or favoritism, God abhors. And so Jacob's favoritism is continuing on, and years have passed by as this favoritism is continuing. And now, at this time, to show his love for his dear Joseph, Jacob gives Joseph a robe of many colors. Now, it's most likely, this term here, it's notoriously difficult to translate. It's most likely a long-sleeved robe that reached all the way to the wrists and all the way down to the ankles. You know, not something, you know, people who work outside would wear because, you know, that that would be costly. They would wear short-sleeved thing and something that's significantly shorter. So this was... Uh, a, a fancy robe. In fact, 2 Samuel 13, 18, this same word is used to talk about the robe of Princess Tamar, the daughter of King David. So this would have been quite a fancy coat that he had. Maybe some special embroidery or some other ornamental decoration on it. It was a garment fit for royalty. And what Jacob is doing here is he's setting Jacob apart as his beloved son and even perhaps even setting him apart as as one who will have the rights of the firstborn son. One who will have the double portion of the inheritance. In fact, that's exactly what will happen because 1 Chronicles 5, 1 to 2 says that Jacob will have the rights of the firstborn and will get the double portion of the inheritance. Now, how do the brothers respond to this? Verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. See, Jacob's partiality 
toward Joseph not only you know, so caused his brothers to hate him, so much so that they couldn't even go and say peace or shalom to him. You know, among the Israelites, that's how they'd greet each other. Shalom and, you know, saying, may peace be with you. But they had so much of hate, they couldn't even bring themselves to greet their brother this way. Jacob showing partiality here is sinful and foolish. You know, the, the, the irony is, Jacob him, himself has experienced this. I mean, can't you remember? Isaac loved Esau. And Rebekah loved Jacob. And we saw the tensions that happened as a result of the favoritism of the children. Jacob has experienced a lot of the painful consequences because of what his parents did. And yet here he is again repeating the same sins of partiality with his sons. And this partiality will not only cause dissension in the family, it will become a great cause of sorrow for Jacob for many years as we will see in the second half of the chapter. Now Jacob has some dreams. And look what happens, verse 5. Now, jo pardon me, Joseph has some dreams. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers that they, told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bound and bow down to my sheaf. Now, particularly in the Old Testament times, when the written word of God was not there, God would reveal his plans and purposes to people. One of the ways he would do that is through dreams. And so here, Joseph has a dream, and you can see he's, he's excited to share his dream. He's saying, behold, behold, behold. He had this dream that I've dreamed. And what's the dream about? Oh, it's harvest time. And we bundled up the grain. And my bundle rose up, and all your bu bundles bowed down to me. Oh, the meaning was very clear to the brothers. So verse 8, it says, His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. You know, Joseph's excitement in telling his brothers, brothers who already hate him, brothers who can't even greet him about his dream and what's the dream about, that he's going to rule over his brothers. I mean, without any tact whatsoever, might again show perhaps Joseph's immaturity or at the very least his naivety. I mean, it's, it's like adding more fuel to the fire. I mean, there's a big gaping wound there and he's adding more salt there. He, there, r let me just rub it in now. I'm going to rule over you brothers as well. And they hated him even more for it. Now Joseph has another dream with similar implications, actually slightly grander implications. And you say, why another dream? Well, because in case there was any doubt with the first dream, or, you know, maybe it just sort of, sort of happened, the second dream with a similar message would confirm that this was certainly from God and it was certainly going to happen. In fact, years later, Joseph himself will say this about the two dreams that Pharaoh will have in Genesis 41, 32. Listen to what uh, Joseph says, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. So it's certain this is going to happen. This is from God. That's why the doubling of the dreams. 
So here's the other dream that Joseph has, verse 9. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Again, excitement. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So the second dream is a little bit more grander, where the whole house of Israel would bow down to Joseph, including the parents. And Joseph is excitedly saying, behold, behold, hey, listen to the second dream now. Now his father, as he listens to this, initially rebukes him. Because, hey, the, the, the promises go downward. Now, me, the one who bears the blessing, has to bow down as well? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So he first rebukes him. He's like, how can you speak like this, Joseph? But then it says, his father kept these things in mind. Because perhaps now he's wondering, I mean, this is, I mean, it's a double dream. You know, I've had dreams. God appeared to me. It, in a vision at Bethel and how God spoke to me that way? Is Joseph going to really rule over all of us? Is the Lord really going to make this happen? So Joseph pondered over these things. But Joseph's brothers on the, hand, on the other hand, I mean, if one dream was enough, I mean, this is, this is it, right? Second dream, more fuel into the fire, that burning fire of their anger. And their anger and envy toward him is now just exploding. I just want to say this with regards to Joseph's brothers. I mean, yes, it was wrong for Jacob to show favoritism to Joseph. That was bad. That was wrong. That was sinful. But at the same time, it is not right for the brothers to be so angry. They're still responsible for their own actions. So when you look at this picture right now, things are not looking good in Jacob's family. Joseph seems a little immature, naive at best. And the rest of the sons, they're filled with hatred and envy toward their brother. And Jacob, the father, well, he's changed a lot from his earlier years, but he's still foolishly playing the favorites game. Some of his old sins still persisting. This is a very dysfunctional family. And things are only going to get worse in this family. But you know what? It is this family, this family of 12 sons, that become the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. It is these sons that are going to be the next patriarchs of the nation of Israel. You say, how can that happen? I mean, this is such a dysfunctional family. Because God will graciously work in this family and change them and make them into a reconciled family, a family that will honor God and a family that will live for Him. Perhaps you are here this morning and you find that you have a dysfunctional family. A family with issues. Maybe you're a parent and you find yourself just struggling with some of your old sins as you interact with your family and you're discouraged. Maybe you have a child that is rebellious and you're discouraged. Maybe there's serious sibling rivalry going on. Or some kind of other trouble between parent and child. Or even significant tension between husband and wife. 
Or maybe there's been other horrible things in your family like abuse or divorce or something else like that. And you're discouraged this morning and you're thinking, oh, I don't see how there's any hope for me or for my family. Let me encourage you and tell you there is always hope because God is a sovereign and gracious God. You see, in all our families, there is some level of dysfunction. And the solution to all the sin and the dysfunction is not ultimately, oh, if I can just get my parenting right, or if I can just get my marriage right, or if I can just get my relationship with my siblings right, or with my parents, or with my in-laws right, then everything will be fine. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying as Christians we shouldn't be faithful as a child or a parent or a spouse or a sibling or, a, or, or whatever other person. We have to be faithful as a Christian. But what I am saying is that ultimately, apart from the grace of God, we will all continue in our sinful ways. Apart from the grace of God, we will all continue in our sinful ways. So trust in God and seek after Him. God is in the business of working through dysfunctional families. And Jacob's family should actually give you hope. Even as you see all the sin and the dysfunction in this family, knowing what God is going to do in this family should give you hope. That there is hope for me and my family as well because God is powerful and gracious to do so. So cling on to him and seek after him. But at this point, all we can see in this family is the hatred, the beloved son of Jacob being hated by his brothers. And from here, we move on to how Joseph then is now sold by his brothers in verses 12 through 36. So all this has happened. Now Jacob's beloved son is now sent on a mission. Verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here I am. And so he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So where is Joseph's brothers pasturing the flock? Near Shechem. Remember, it was at Shechem the brothers slaughtered all the men and then plundered the entire place and took women and children as captives. Why? Because one man defiled their sister Dinah. So the family would have had a reputation of having violent, murderous sons. So this wouldn't have been a safe place for these sons of Jacob to be near Shechem. So Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers to make sure they're doing okay, that they're not in trouble, and in fact that they're also themselves not causing trouble with others. And from Hebron, which is where they were, to Shechem, that's roughly about 80 kilometers. It's about a five-day journey by foot. So it's not a safe place. It's a long, arduous journey for this 17-year-old teenager. There's already big tensions between this teenager and his older brothers. And how does Joseph respond? Here I am. He does exactly as his father tells him and makes the trek to Shechem. 
What you see here is Joseph is an obedient son. So this might also give us a clue into why another reason why this was dad's beloved son. He was a very obedient son of his. And now when Joseph gets to Shechem, he couldn't find his brothers. Verse 15, and a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, what are you seeking? Am I seeking my brothers? He said. Oh, I, I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they've gone away, for I've heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. You can already see God at work here. I mean, it just so happens that young teenager, all by himself, he's, he's wandering in Shechem in the fields. And he bumps into this man who happened to hear, see his brothers and overhear their brothers that they were going to Dothan. This was God at work, providentially leading Joseph toward his brothers and away from his home. Now, Dothan is another 25 kilometers away from Shechem. So that's what, uh, maybe another couple of days. Now, at this point, Joseph, as a 17-year-old, could have said, okay, I've come all this far. It's dangerous enough for me to come by myself and then come to this place. Now, to travel another couple of days to find my brothers, brothers who hate me, no, I'm, I'm heading back home. Joseph could have said that. He could have done that. But he doesn't do that. In fact, he travels further to Dothan. Once again, it shows Joseph's obedience. He, as a son, he was undeterred in fulfilling his father's mission. Now, verse 18 Look at how the brothers respond. They saw him from afar. And before he came near to him, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. So the brothers see Joseph coming from afar. Young 17-year-old Joseph coming from afar. Maybe he walked a particular way. I mean, he certainly had his fancy coat on. And he's all alone, away from home. And they say to one another, here comes the dreamer. Literally, the Lord of the dreams. Because that's what the dreams reveal, right? That he was going to be Lord over them. And so they're really mocking him at this point. Oh, here comes the great Lord of the dreams. And the anger and the hate is building up now. And it finally leads to a plan to kill their brother. I mean, in one sense, this shouldn't be surprising, right? Because the Bible says... The heart of anger is the heart of murder. If you have anger in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. So the brothers plan that the anger is now, they're planning to act it out. Their plan is to kill Joseph, throw him into a pit, and then lie to their father and everyone else that a wild animal has killed him. And they say, then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. You know, what's ironic is, what these brother, brothers are rejecting in what was shown in the dream that Jacob would become a ruler, really he would become the Lord and Savior of them. This was God's plan to save them. That's what they're rejecting. That's what they don't like. And now Reuben, the oldest brother, intervenes. 
But when, verse 21, but when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take this life, his life. And Reuben said to him, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Now, if you remember, Reuben is the firstborn son, and as I mentioned before, to exercise his dominance, he slept with his father's wife, one of his father's wives. And so, you know, Reuben was out of the picture as the firstborn. But there's a possibility that what Reuben is trying to do here is he's trying to gain favor with his father again because he's fallen out with his father now. So look at what the brothers do, verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. So the, they stripped Joseph of that fancy coat of his. They threw him into an empty pit. Really, the pit would have been like an open grave. It would have been deep enough that he wouldn't have been able to climb out of it. Sure, technically speaking, they're not shedding blood. But essentially, they've just dumped or thrown Joseph into this deep pit. Joseph would have been bruised and hurt without any water or food. He's just left for dead in this open grave. And notice verse 25. Then they sat down to eat. Can you imagine that? Oh, this, you know, now that all this is over... Let's go get something to eat now. I mean, they are so callous. They have no concern for their brother. This is the human heart apart from the grace of God. Moving on, continuing on in verse 25. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him, and then the Midianite traders passed by. And they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, first thing I want to note here is Midianites and Ishmaelites are used interchangeably here. And that's because by this time, the Ishmaelites and Midianites, they had intermarried and they had essentially become one group. So you could call them either Ishmaelites or Midianites. And evidently, at this point, Reuben, the oldest brother, was away for some reason. Maybe he was tending the flock or, or something else. And as the Ishmaelite traders came along, Judah, one of the other brothers, has, comes up with another idea. Oh, let's make a profit. See, because simply killing Joseph, that's not going to do anything for us. In fact, after this, we will slowly see Judah emerging as a leader amongst his brothers. And he says, let's sell him as a slave to these traders and make some money. And so what do they do? They sell their brother that they hated so much for 20 shekels of silver. And Joseph is taken to Egypt. Now Reuben returns, and we find in verse 29, when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Now as the oldest in the family, he probably had the main responsibility as well for his little brother. I mean, he was trying to pass things up with his father, but now he's like, okay, we've got to go back to father, we've got to go back home, where am I going to go now? 
What am I going to say? Verse 31. Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify it, whether it's your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It's my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So the brothers don't do according to what Reuben said, but they do according to what Judah said. They sell him off, and they take that fancy coat of his, dips it in a blood of goat, and then gives it to their father. And says, Father, inspect this. And the conclusion can only be that some wild animal has killed Joseph. You know, there's an irony here with what's happening. You know, many years ago, Jacob deceived his father his own father using his brother's cloth and the skin of goat. Now Jacob's sons deceive him with their brother's coat and the blood of a goat. Jacob's own sin is coming full circle back at him. And Jacob is so distressed and dis distraught and even though, I mean, even here, his sons are being so disingenuous. They're trying to comfort father. Oh, it's okay, father. But they, they're lying to him. But even though they're being disingenuous, no matter who comforted Jacob, Jacob is inconsolable. And he weeps and is sorrowful over the death of his beloved son, or so he thinks. Now verse 36, it's almost like here's the scene at home and then the scene shifts. You know, it's, it's almost like a cliffhanger. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Joseph is alive, he is not dead, but he'll never again returned home. You know, what I want you to see here is the beauty and power of God's workings. I mean, it is precisely because of what Jacob did, his favoritism, and then the dreams that came the hatred of the brothers grew. And what were the brothers saying? Oh, we're going to stop this. Oh, he's going to be ruler. We're going to stop that. And so because of that, they came up with this plan. And finally now, Joseph is far away. But you know what the funny thing is? This is God's plan working out. This is God sending Joseph to Egypt many years before. Why? So that while there'll be some difficulties Joseph will go through, ultimately he'll be raised up to the right hand of power to save these brothers and the father and the rest of the family. I mean, the brothers thought they could stop God. But God, in fact, even through the sin of the brothers, God's plan is being worked out. God is never the author of sin. He never tempts anyone to sin. But do you see the power of God's sovereignty? 
of God's workings. And how beautiful it is, because it gives us hope, right? Even through the sin, God can work to bring about his sovereign plan for the good of his people. And I would also just say this, as I mentioned at the start. This really sets up a pattern of where God will send deliverers who are to rule his people and even save his people where the people reject him, but God raises them up and saves them. The pattern is seen as Moses, you see it in David and, and in some others as well. And ultimately that pattern is fulfilled in the ultimate Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, because God the Father sent his beloved Son and sent him to this world on a mission. He was born a Jew and he reached out to the, the Jewish community around him. And what did they do? They rejected him. They didn't like what he was saying. And then ultimately, that anger grew up so much, they delivered him to foreigners. Where the king of kings was treated like nothing. Like a slave or worse than a slave. And he was mocked at, oh, he's the king of kings? Yeah, right. Then save yourself and others. They put a robe on him, mocking him as the king of kings, and stripped him of all his clothes. And you know what they finally did? They killed him. Yeah, the precious son of God, God the Son who came in the form of a man. What does the sinful man do to such innocence or such righteousness and a beautiful God that has come to save his people? The sinful heart hates and murders the Son of God. But the wonderful thing is, or people thought he was dead. He wasn't actually dead. Yes, he did die. For three days he was in the grave. And on the third day he rose up for the, from the grave. And then he would be raised to the right hand of the father. To rule from the right hand of his father. Why? To save people like you and me who rejected him and put him on that cross in the first place. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the hope we have. That's why there's hope for anyone to change even this morning. There is hope of eternal life. There's hope. Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't, you don't know Jesus, let me tell you, if you keep rejecting him even after what you've heard this morning and you continue to live your ways, the news is not good for you because Jesus will come one day to condemn all those who rejected him. But the reason why you are listening to this sermon today, as you hear the good news of Jesus, the graciousness of God shown through his son, Jesus Christ, a pattern of that that was seen in the life of Joseph. God is being gracious to you this morning. To say, turn from your heart of wickedness and turn to him and see who he is and what he has done on the cross. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you say, I believe, I believe in him and I rest in him, then I would say then turn from your sin. Turn from living yourself for yourself and live for Jesus because that is the proof that you have truly put your trust 
in him. For those of us who are believers, maybe you find yourself in a pit like Joseph, bruised and broken and hurt and uncertain of what will happen perhaps, scared. Brother, sister, I just want to tell you, I don't know what the what just the immediate tomorrow holds for you. There may be ups and downs for you. You know, life may get better, life may not get better. But I can tell you this, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know what's gonna ultimately happen. When Jesus returns, he will wipe away every tear, every suffering that you're going through right now will come to an end. Justice will be meted out. And you and I who have put our trust in Jesus will be with him forever for all of eternity. That is the hope that we have. And because we know that, because we know what's coming in Genesis 50, that's why when we read this, in some sense, we're like, oh, I know what's going to happen. Similarly, we know what's going to happen ultimately to us, don't we? So let's live with hope. Let's, let's live with a love for him and, and not even harboring bitterness or grudges toward others, but really have concern for others and go out and reach out to others and tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ and pray that they too will come to know him, for he alone is the only hope of salvation for anyone. Let's pray together. Father, we marvel at your grace. For we know that apart from your grace, we would all be lost. And yet, Father, we also confess that so many times when things don't go the way we expect, we think it's all up to us. Lord, forgive us for thinking that way. For we know that your wise and gracious and good plans are always for the good of your people. And we know what you will ultimately do when Christ returns. So help us, Father, to be faithful to you. To be faithful to live out our Christian lives, representing Jesus in this fallen world. Freed from our sin with a hope of continued change and free to love others as Jesus loved others. Father, we pray that what we heard this morning would not simply go into one year and go out the other, but it would sink deep into our hearts and help us to live in conformity to your ways and into the likeness of Jesus. For In his name we pray. Amen.